Amen. We have uh, the great opportunity uh, to begin studying through the, the book of Acts today. And Acts is a little bit unique among the New Testament letters. Uh, Acts is not a gospel like you might read in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. The gospels describe the life and the teaching of Jesus. They, they tell his, his parables and of the miracles that he did. And ultimately, they're going to tell of the passion of Christ where Jesus Christ, he gave his life on the cross for our sin, that he was buried in the grave and he rose on the third day. The Gospels all tell that story. Um, and Acts is unlike the epistles or the letters that Paul wrote to the churches in Corinth and Thessalonica and Rome, uh, in that um, Acts is not written to a very specific people in a specific place at a specific time. That's why we write letters. Um, and it's not one where we can just read uh, everything there and think, oh, this is something I should live out in my, my life. We're going to see in a minute that Acts is primarily descriptive of what happened rather than prescriptive of what should happen, right? So we read about things that went on uh, among the early church uh, that God did, uh, and oftentimes even things that people did that weren't the best. Um, and so while we can appreciate the work of God there and the things that God ultimately used for, his, for our good and His glory, but we don't always want to repeat those things. And so we have this unique book um, in the middle of the New Testament, if you will, uh, and it's what's known as a historical narrative. Um, and just to explain a bit for you, um, Acts contains uh, historical events, things that happen, and the Dr. Luke is the author, and he's writing these things down that we might know them, um, and, but it's in, in narrative form. What it isn't is a history text. If you were to go back and study history in the first century, there are all sorts of things that happen that Luke did not include. He didn't uh, intend to make an exhaustive uh, uh, book about everything that possibly happened, but instead, Acts is unique in that it traces not the work of Jesus and his ministry, but instead uh, Acts traces the work of Jesus Christ through the, the founding of the church by the power of the Holy Spirit to take the gospel to the world. Now, what's so interesting to me about Acts, what is so fills my heart with hope as we read through Acts, is that Jesus uh, has ascended into heaven. He's about to ascend into heaven, and he's going to begin this profound work through his disciples that literally changes the world. Like, we're sitting here today because the 12 men who were commissioned by Jesus Christ, or the 11 men who heard these words, they began began to do and to say all that Jesus taught them to do and to say, and they did so in the power of the Spirit and at great cost to their own lives, such that today in 2021, we celebrate the presence of 2.5 billion Christians around the world today. And church, I would just ask you, what is stopping us from living in such a way today? What is stopping us by the power of the Holy Spirit from reaching out to our neighbors and having hope for our lost relatives and the people that live down the street from us, having hope for our coworkers and saying, God, if you could use those guys, then you could use me. And so today we begin a journey of the study of the early church. A group of men and women, not unlike you and me. Most of them spoke different languages. They lived in profoundly different zip codes. But they were ordinary men and women that God used to turn the world upside down. So today, I want to invite you on this journey with me, studying the book of Acts and the work of God. And I invite you with me to just ask the question, why can't that happen in me? Why can't that happen in our church? Now, as I told you before, Acts is descriptive. It's not prescriptive. Uh, what we shouldn't seek is that God would just duplicate all the miracles that he did in Acts and expect that, you know, if I'll pray hard enough and read enough of the Word and seek the Spirit enough, then suddenly I'm going to have a handkerchief that people can take to other people and they're going to get healed and it's going to be these overwhelming, miraculous things. Now, listen, I hope God does that. We can look forward to miracles. I believe God still performs miracles, but they're literally called miracles 
because they're rare. They're hard to, to, to understand. Like it's God does something extraordinary in a time. He doesn't do what's ordinary, right? That's why they're called miracles. And so you're going to read about miracles in the book of Acts. You can pray for those things. We can look forward to those things. However, Acts describes what God did, not necessarily what he's going to do every single time. You're going to see a, a husband and wife named Ananias and Sapphira who had been moved by the Holy Spirit. They had come to faith in Jesus Christ. They went and sold a piece of property. And, and they brought most of that to the feet of the apostles. They're like, hey, we're going to give it all to the Lord like we sold this piece of property. It's all going to go to God because that's how the early church lived. They were all in. It wasn't like sort of Christian. It was, I'm selling everything and I'm following Jesus. And yet Ananias and Sapphira, they, they lied about what they really did. They sold everything, kept a little portion back for themselves, gave most of it to the church. And because they lied, they fell down dead. Now, again, Acts is going to describe what happened, not necessarily what should happen. You should not look to Ananias and Sapphira and be like, you know, this is how we should give. If you have a piece of land, you should sell it today, right? That's not necessarily what we should conclude. And we certainly shouldn't conclude that we should lie to people about the way that we give, right? That's not here. But we're going to see described the overwhelming and the powerful work of God through an ordinary group of people. So I want to invite you to open to Acts chapter 1. One with me, and we're going to set a little bit of background for you just so you can kind of understand the, the letter and the setting and what's going on. So, I told you before that this is written by Luke, who most uh, early sources, most scholars today would tell you uh, was probably a doctor. Um, it's kind of attested in other places, not in the scripture. He doesn't say Luke the doctor. Uh, Luke was an interesting guy. He must have come to faith in Christ. He cared very much about the work of the gospel going forth. There is What happens later in the book, if you read right now, um, you're going to kind of get this distant voice where Luke is telling a story about things that happened in places and among people that he, he never saw. But later on in the book, you're going to start seeing that Luke begins to use the term we, as he talks about Paul's journeys, he's going to say, we went here, we did these things, we were working in this place. And so Luke was involved very much in the mission himself. And so uh, as you look to verse 1 here, uh, you need to know Luke is a believer in Jesus Christ. He wants to be faithful about what he's talking about here. And he opens by saying, the first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach. And that's a really weird way to start a book, if you ask me. Right? I mean, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. You're like, what? What's happening here? This, this isn't a very good story you're telling. He says, the first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. Now, if you'll bear with me for just a minute and you'll turn back to Luke chapter 1, you're going to see the first account that Luke composed, and that is the gospel of Luke. And if, if you're here and you, you don't necessarily believe in Christ, maybe you're kind of skeptical about the teachings of the church and the Bible, uh, here's what Luke would want you to know about what he wrote. So in Luke chapter 1, verse 1, he says, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us. Lots of people have tried to write these things down. There have been lots of account, but um, just as they were handed down to us by those who were from the beginning, or from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the exact truth about the things that you have been told. And so just to summarize a bit for you, it's likely that this man, Theophilus, was a fellow believer. He probably had a lot of money, and he'd commissioned Luke to write down the things that they had heard about, the events that had taken place. And so he begins, Luke begins with the gospel, writing out all that, that Jesus was doing and teaching the work of Christ while he was here on this earth. And so Luke is being careful. It says that he, he depended upon eyewitnesses. Luke didn't make stuff up. He didn't hear it from a person who heard it from a person who heard it from a person, right? It wasn't like uh, Poto gossip, right? I mean, he heard it firsthand. He talked to the eyewitnesses. Okay, what did you see? What did you hear? And he begins to write these things down so that we may know the exact truth about what happened. So Luke isn't like a slouch. 
He's being careful in these things. He's investigating them. He heard from multiple people and multiple sources in order to write out his gospel. And in Acts chapter 1, he just continues that on. The first part was about the ministry and the work of Jesus Christ. And the second part here is going to be about the work of the church in the world. So again, the first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. Now, what are these orders that he's talking about? Uh, if you're uh, we're, we're good in Sunday school or you've been around, you probably know that just before Jesus ascends into heaven, he gathers his disciples together and he says, All authority on heaven and earth has been given unto me. So I want you to go and to make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you and surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. And so Jesus had given his apostles this, uh, well, it's a weighty task, right? Just take the gospel to all the nations, make sure they're obeying everything that I've commanded you. It is weighty. And yet Jesus said, hey, hey, remember that I'm with you always, even to the very end of the age. However, that's not all that Jesus told them. And Luke's going to pick up here by sharing with us just a little bit more to the story before Jesus ascends into heaven. In verse 3, it says, To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering. Jesus went to the cross. He was buried for three days. He rose from the grave, and he appeared uh, several different times to his apostles. Now, in order to understand the context, what you need to know about his apostles, Jesus had called them uh, three years prior. Uh, they left their jobs and their families and everything they had known behind, and they began to follow after Jesus. And they, they got to see him walk on water. They passed out the bread and the fish when he, when he turned the, the five loaves and two fish and, and made him able to feed 5,000. Like, they saw blind Bartimaeus receive his sight. And Jesus had sent these guys out. He's like, hey, I want you to heal the sick. I want you to cast out the demons. And they had done it. And when they came back, they were like, did y'all see that? Man, like God was working through us and the, even the demons obeyed us. Like, wow, like this is profound what Jesus is doing. And they'd heard all the parables. They got to sit and have the private conversations with Jesus. They'd been rebuked by him a few times. They got out of line. But they had walked and talked with Jesus Christ. And then came the time for Jesus to be arrested. And one by one, they all fled. They all abandoned them. Peter, who was the most brash and bold, had said to Jesus, Jesus, even if I have to die, I'm never going to deny you. And Jesus looked at Peter and he said, Peter, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And if you read the, the account in John's gospel, well, any of the gospels, John's is perhaps the most clear. Jesus had been arrested, and they'd taken him to the house of the high priest. He's sitting inside, and they've been mocking him, questioning him, and beating him. They would take a hood or something. They would cover the face of Jesus, and they would take turns hitting him. They would mock him, saying, hey, if you're God, if you're a prophet, why don't you tell us who just hit you? Why don't you demonstrate that you're a king or a prophet or you're the son of God? Just demonstrate that for us. And so blow after blow after blow, uh, they were beating Jesus as he was inside the house. And Peter, um, he, he still cared. I mean, he did flee uh, when, they all, when, they got, uh, when they came to arrest Jesus, but he was kind of hanging outside in the, in the front yard, if you will, of the high priest, a little slave girl. Hey, weren't you one of those guys that was with Jesus? No, no, I don't, I don't know who Jesus is. Goes to another place. He's warming his hands by a fire. You know what? I, I really think I saw you with Jesus. No, I wasn't with Jesus. And a third time, she keeps pressing the issue, as people often do, and he curses and swears he's never even met the man. The Bible tells us that Jesus was able to look out the window, and he turned his face toward Peter. We're not told specifically what happened here, but I'm just guessing that their eyes met about the time that the rooster crowed. And Peter realizes, I've just done what I swore that I would never do. 
John, the one whom Jesus loved, the young man who, who got to lean back against Jesus, who was his closest uh, of the apostles. When Jesus got arrested, apparently he was a little bit slower. They grabbed his cloak, and he was so scared he fled naked to get away from it all. Every one of the apostles whom had seen every miracle that you and I might long to see. They heard all the teaching firsthand. They got to ask the private questions. Watch Jesus as he walked with the Father. Seen, I mean, profound demonstrations. Every single one of these men fell away and abandoned Jesus. But then Jesus rose from the dead. And he began to appear to them. He showed himself to them. He began to, to teach them. He appeared to a group of the apostles, and they, they got to see him and walk with him and talk with him a bit. And they came, and they were bragging. And Thomas, who was the one who doubted, was like, listen, guys, I appreciate you. I, I know what you said here, uh, but I'm not going to believe it unless I get to see the marks in his hands, unless I get to touch it, unless I get to see the hole in his side. And the scriptures tell us that eight days later, Jesus appears to Thomas. He says, go ahead. You can touch it. You can see it. Jesus says, Thomas, stop doubting and believe. And Thomas proclaims, my Lord and my God. So as Luke begins Acts here, there's a lot that's already happened. There's a whole lot behind it. We don't just begin in Acts with a bunch of guys who launch a really great church that goes worldwide. That's not the story. Acts is ultimately the story of Jesus Christ, what he has done, and what he has continued to do in our world. So I'm going to read it one more time to you, and we're going to walk through some verses here together. And as the church of Jesus Christ, we're a couple of thousand years removed at this point, we're going to see what God would ultimately have for us today. Acts chapter 1, verse 1. The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs. Go ahead and touch the marks. Go ahead and place your hand in my side. Many convincing proofs appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait. Just wait. They'd known Jesus, and walked with Jesus, and talked with Jesus. They'd heard his teaching. They could probably mimic many of the parables. They'd memorize these things. And they'd seen the works. They'd participated in healing people and casting out demons. And Jesus, in his final word to them, he says, wait. Don't try to do this on your own. And then he goes on to tell them why. Wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you, you heard it from me. Guys, I, t I told you this was coming. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. In John chapter 16, verse 7, we get the record of Jesus telling them about the coming of the Holy Spirit, and he, he doesn't just say, hey, there's somebody coming. He, he says it in, in terms that might surprise us. John 16, 7, he says, But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. I know that you've walked with me and talked with me, and I've done these overwhelming miracles. I, need, I know that you've heard words directly from the mouth of the Son of God. I know that we've been preaching to thousands at times. I know that we've had an overwhelming ministry here, but it's better if I go. And then he explains why. 
For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Many of us, we've looked back on times in our lives, maybe you, you said the words just like I have, oh, I wish I could have seen that. You read the biblical stories and you're like, can you imagine? That man was crippled from birth and getting to see him walk. Man, I would have loved to have heard the woman at the well describe like how Jesus had, had loved her and told her about everything she'd ever done, about how she'd found the Messiah. Man, I wish I could have seen it when, when the guys were out fishing. This would have been comforting to all of us guys, right? I wish I could have been there when the men had been out fishing all night and they hadn't caught anything. Jesus said, hey, throw your net on the other side of the boat. And then it was so full, they almost, almost sunk the boats on the way in. I wish I could have been there. When Jesus walked on the water, like how profound would that have been? And yet, Jesus said to his disciples, and he would, we need to hear these words for us, it is better. What we have is better. It was better that Jesus would go away because we were ultimately going to receive the promise of the Holy Spirit, the helper. Uh, in, in the Greek, it's the word paraclete. Helper or advocate or comforter or strengthener, if, if you will. It's better if I go away. Now, Jesus commanded the disciples to wait because they were still weak. Yeah, they'd healed the sick, they cast out demons, they knew the teachings, but he commanded them to wait. Because they were still weak. That in and of those apostles who were present on that day, there was no power to accomplish anything. So he commanded them to wait. For what he had promised them, for what he had told them was going to come. And in verse 6 it says, So when they had come together, they were asking him, Lord, is it at this time that you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They were doing what we do today, right? Hey, Jesus, things are really broken in our culture. I don't know if you see it, but, man, it's hard to be a Jew right now. Roman emperors, man, you never know who might even be next. Might even take our lives or our freedom. Jesus, are you going to establish a nation state for, for the Jews and Israel and we get to be your people and you get to be our God and there's this wonderful bliss here on this earth? Jesus, are you going to fix things politically now? Are you a political savior where we can kind of order and arrange the world to where it's going to suit us? Like we're going to get to live in this Christian nation, right? And no one's going to oppose us or do things we don't like. They're not going to make laws that frustrate us. Jesus, are you going to fix everything now? Jesus responds to him. It's not for you to know the times of the epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. Jesus was going to restore the kingdom. It wasn't an earthly one, and it wasn't a political one. It was the kingdom of God. He says, guys, you're trying your focus here. A nation state where everybody's going to affirm the same things. Everybody's going to know what's right and wrong. Jesus is the king. The disciples kind of hope to be in charge, by the way. You know, if people just listen to them, then the world would have been better. Jesus says, there's something different for you. There's something so much more important than a kingdom that would fade, than a government that would have failed. And he says to these 11 men, all of whom had betrayed him, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you're going to be my witnesses here in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. 
these men who have been told to wait because they were weak were going to become witnesses when the Holy Spirit came upon them. It, while in their own strength they were going to accomplish nothing, Jesus is like, don't even go, don't even try it. But when the Holy Spirit comes, you're going to receive power. And that's going to empower you to live differently. It's going to empower you to speak differently. It's going to empower you to live a totally different life, seeking a totally different kingdom. And it's going to change everything. It's going to start here in Jerusalem, and it's just going to radiate out from there. Judea, Samaria, even to the remotest parts of the earth. And sometimes, as we read these stories, we think, man, that's really neat what God did. And we profoundly underestimate the power of the Holy Spirit for us today. Church, apart from the empowering work of the Holy Spirit in us, we can accomplish nothing. Nothing. You're not going to live a righteous life. You're not going to be a witness for Jesus Christ. You're not going to be the dad you want to be, the mom you want to be, the kids you want to be. It's not going to happen. And maybe as we wake up every morning, we open up the Word and we hit our knees, we might hear the voice of Jesus saying, wait, don't do this in your flesh. And would you operate out of the power of the Spirit? So to give you a little bit of a rundown of, of how the Spirit works in us, and, and by the way, I'm not going to give you all of it. I, I don't have time to preview Acts and, and preach a little bit of a sermon and then give you the whole theology of the Holy Spirit. But here's what we believe as, as Christians, that we serve a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There are three persons in one God, and if that's mysterious to you, it should be because God is bigger than us, Right? And the Holy Spirit, in, according to John chapter 14, verse 16 and 17, when he comes to live within us, when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit would come to dwell within us. In John 14, 16 and 17, it says that he will be with us forever. This Holy Spirit will never leave us or forsake us. You're never going to be on your own. You never have to operate in your own strength. In John 14, 26, it says that he will teach us and remind us of God's word. If you'll remember, the apostles, even when Jesus would be speaking in, in parables, they're like, what did you mean? He's like, you're still not hearing it? You still don't understand? Do you know who helps us understand? Men out there who are afraid to pick up the word of God, if you have the spirit of God, if you come to faith in Christ, you have everything you need to understand the word of God in the power of the spirit. Ladies, it's the same for you. You can know the Word of God. John chapter 15, verse 26, tells us that the Holy Spirit will testify about Christ through us. And you might think, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not a real good talker. No, I'm, I'm kind of shy. I get real sweaty and anxious, and I can't do it. Listen, God once used a donkey. I promise he can use you. God can work through you, and it's the power of the Holy Spirit through you and all of your weakness and inability. God knows you're weak. That's why he told you to wait on the Spirit, right? That you might be a witness just like these early disciples were. John chapter 16, 8, the Holy Spirit will con convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. And that starts with us, right? You want to know what sin is? And seek after the Holy Spirit. He'll lead you. He'll help you understand the Word. You want to know what a righteous life looks like? Through the power of the Spirit, we look into the Word. If you want to know about the judgment that's coming, that's revealed to us through the Spirit and the Word. Number five, the Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth. And number six, the Holy Spirit will empower us. And I just want to make this more personal. If you're here today and you have come to faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit will empower us. You. Jesus isn't surprised that you're weak apart from him. But many of us have a whole lot more faith in our weakness than we do in God's power. Like the Holy Spirit will empower you. I told you that all the men who had been in the hearing of Jesus on this day, they had denied and abandoned him. They'd run away. Some of them went back to their former occupations. Jesus had to gather them back up. Now remember, you're going to be my disciples, right? And I want you to go make more disciples and teach people to obey. I want you to go out and be witnesses in this world. All the men had abandoned. 
But when the Holy Spirit came, 11 of the 12 would ultimately be martyred for their faith. So steadfast in their witness, unwavering in that witness that they were, more, they were willing to die before they would deny knowing Jesus. Now these things aren't all written in Scripture, but tradition tells us that Philip was crucified in the Greek city of Hierapolis, which is in present-day Turkey. Andrew was killed on an X-shaped cross in Patras, Greek. Peter was crucified upside down in Rome under the brutal reign of Nero. Simon the Zealot was rumored to have been sawn in half in present-day Iran. Bartholomew was killed in Armenia. After he led the king of Armenia to faith in Christ, the king's closest associates, they, they killed him there for it. Matthew was murdered in Ethiopia. And Thomas, I'm not going to believe it until I see the scars, until I touch the hole in his side. Thomas was killed in India after sharing the gospel with a, a group of women who professed Christ. And their husbands became so enraged that they killed him right there on the spot. John, the one who fled naked, the only one who wasn't martyred. He lived out the rest of his days in exile after having been boiled in tar and refusing to recant. I believe that the church of Jesus Christ has for far too long been attempting to live out our faith out of our weakness rather than the Holy Spirit's power. Could we as the church of Jesus Christ that lives in Poto area, LaFleur County, in 2021, and could we be so bold? Could we just have a moment of faith to trust in Jesus Christ and say, I need to hear the word, like, wait, don't do it on your own. Don't try to be the dad you want to be on your own, or the husband, or the wife, or the mother, or the employee, or, or the person who works in the community. Don't try to accomplish it on your own. But because of the Holy Spirit, and you're going to have power, and you're going to be my witness right here, out further in our county, across our nation, across our world today, that you could be my witness there. The story of the church in Acts is ultimately the story of the Holy Spirit empowering weak and incapable people to do extraordinary things. It is the work of the Holy Spirit through men and women who have sinned like you have sinned, who are weak where you're weak, who might struggle with the same struggles that you deal with, who had endured many of the same forms of suffering that you have endured, and God used them to change the world, and he's been doing it for 2,000 years since. My prayer today is that Cross Community Church would not show up here for an hour a week to sing a few songs and to hear a sermon to check some form of religious box. Every week we would be, come back here to be reminded of what we've been called to do, to make disciples who are obedient to everything he's commanded and to remember the empowering work of the Holy Spirit in us. You know, I don't want to live out the rest of my life going through motions. I don't want to spend the next 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 or however many years I have left showing up for a week to do something on Sunday that's not going to affect Monday through Saturday. I want God to write a story through what happens in this church by the power of His Holy Spirit that looks something like what happened in Acts. That if people could look back in 2,000 years, they'd see a group of people that were rather unremarkable. But a God who was powerful. A God who was continuing his work in this world. A God who did extraordinary things through ordinary people. And a God who could do it on our own. So how do we begin to walk by the Holy Spirit as the people of God 
2,000 years after this happened, how do we begin to do this thing? I believe it's in the original formulation of what Jesus called us to do when he called us to be disciples. To deny yourself and take up your cross, I want you to follow me. Church, there is something of self-denial. If we're going to follow after Jesus Christ, we can't chase after every fleshly desire. We can't chase after fame and fortune and success and being liked by people and all the things that our flesh might cry out for and faithfully follow Jesus. So every day, you get up, God, I'm weak and I know it. I need the power of your Holy Spirit that I might deny myself, take up my cross and follow you. The the second piece is just praying prayers of constant dependence. I promise you that your weakness is going to remind you that it's there. And you're going to fail. You're going to struggle. You're going to get anxious. You're going to grow fearful at times. And so we pray prayers of constant dependence. God, I know where my thoughts are going right now. I need you to lead my mind to purity. God, in this moment, I'm tempted to be impatient and to get angry. But God, I know that in the power of your Holy Spirit who resides within me, I have patience right now. I have gentleness. It's all there in the power of the Spirit. I know the weakness of my flesh. Now, God, would you manifest the power of your Spirit? So we deny our flesh and we pray prayers of constant dependence. And in faith, we obey. Through the power of the Spirit. It's God, whatever you've called me to do, God, I want to do it. And we could return to that great commission given to 11 guys 2,000 years ago. That we could be about the work of making disciples and teaching them to obey. Our, our mission statement here is we want to lead all people to become fully devoted disciples of Jesus Christ. And we just pray, God, would you make it so? God, would you use us for that? Would you bow with me? Lord, we live in a place that for all the good things that we have around us, God, we know that there is suffering and there is pain and there's brokenness and there's addiction and there's divorce, there's abuse. People are lonely, they're isolated and they're hurting. And then sometimes, God, we see people who appear successful and yet they're just as empty. And God, we know that you've called us to be your witnesses in this world. To tell people of the one thing that will satisfy them of the good news of Jesus Christ and what you've done for them. God, I pray that we wouldn't attempt this in our own weakness. But as the church of Jesus Christ, may we go forward in the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray that you would make witnesses of us, people who would never believe you could do it in us, people who are hesitant and fearful and anxious and not sure that we are are ready to to, to be honest and and just, just say, God, I don't know if I can do this. I can't share with my friend or my loved one. God, through the power of your Spirit, would you make this so in us? Would you make your appeals through us? God, we pray that we might just have a small part in your ongoing work in this world. Surrendered to you and to your work. God, may it be so in us. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.